Yes, it's another Kerbal Space Program video. One of my fans described KSP not as a game, but as an educational tool, and I consider it to be both. I've already used it for one video to illustrate the basics of orbital mechanics, and today I'd like to explain how it parallels real-world space exploration. You see, space travel is an industry, and it's gone through a number of phases over the years, shifting its focus and budgetary restrictions in ways that seem, from the outside perspective, oddly random. However, when you play a career game of Kerbal, you begin to understand exactly why things went the way they did. The game starts, technically, in an era equivalent to the 1940s, shortly before NASA was actually founded. Basic scientific discoveries were made using small ballistic rockets equivalent to the V-2 rockets that were fired into the sky by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. These rockets were modified from their military origin, with their explosive payload replaced by a package of instruments weighing half as much as the warhead. The real legacy of these rockets were their use as preparation for the next flights to space. They laid the foundation for liquid fuel rockets that would come later, and in 1946, V-2 number 13 would become the first man-made object that would take a photograph from outer space from an altitude of 105 kilometers. Ooh, look at that curve. In KSP, the game's first goals are to fire basic solid-fueled rockets to different altitudes to gather scientific data from different heights and eventually escape the atmosphere. While the Earth's Kármán line is approximately 100 kilometers, the planet Kerbin is scaled down by about one-third, making its Kármán line at about 70 kilometers. On the way to reaching this point, one will develop rocket technology enough to be in an era comparable to the NASA Mercury and Gemini programs in the 1950s and 60s. Around this time, the space race had kicked off following the launch of the Soviet satellite Sputnik 1, becoming the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. Shortly afterward, Yuri Gagarin performed a single orbit, the first manned space flight, and in response, the newly formed NASA started Project Mercury. These began as suborbital flights, and ended with full orbital flights. New technologies were being incorporated now, such as retro rockets to bring spacecraft back out of an orbit, and a blade of heat shielding to protect the craft during the heat of atmospheric re-entry. Conversely, this is the same things one develops at this stage of KSP while obtaining a stable curve in orbit. Smaller, more fuel-efficient engines designed specifically for use in vacuum, and RCS thrusters to reorient and move around a craft during orbital rendezvous. Around this time, one may encounter a phase of the game similar to Project Gemini, which had goals to perfect the technology and techniques that would later be used for Apollo, such as EVA activity and pioneering orbital maneuvers to achieve rendezvous and docking. The next point of focus in the game quickly becomes the Moon, a celestial body obviously analogous to the Moon. Now that research in low and high orbit have been done, heavier engines are available to make orbital transfers to the Moon and eventually achieve a stable orbit around it. We are now in an age comparable to the Apollo program, arguably the golden age of space travel. I find a good metaphor for Apollo to be the lengthy voyages across the oceans during the days of colonizing the Americas. These were primitive wooden ships with no equipment more advanced than a compass and the stars above to navigate. These were dangerous voyages undertaken by daredevils, much like the Apollo missions. Primitive computers aboard powerful, expensive rockets sent die-hard Air Force pilots deep into space, and at this point, there wasn't any infrastructure to support such a thing. There were very few satellites, and global efforts were needed to keep in contact with the spacecraft. Much of this is the same in KSP. The rockets available to send Kerbals to the moon are primitive, expensive, and powerful. The first CSMs are usually simplistic Mark I command pods with a single occupant, or maybe a two-stage lander also usually having a single Kerbal that actually lands on the surface. Most of the science is gathered thanks to having well-trained Kerbals who have had practice due to the Mercury and Gemini phases of the game, and the Moon becomes a scientific gold mine, as each large crater on it is an individual biome with its own data to be gathered. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. At 40 feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet two and a half down. Straight shadow. Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. Ready? Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward. Just. Good. Ready?
Contact light. Okay, engine stop. ACA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This allows the player access to a massive array of technology, bringing us into the next stage of space travel. In 1974, NASA launched its first space station, called Skylab. It was a single piece, and crewed by three astronauts at a time for around 24 weeks. Unfortunately, NASA was unable to boost its orbit once it decayed, and it burned up in the Earth's atmosphere in 1979. This is the CASA Space Lab, the first station I launched during my KSP career. The first orbital stations offered by the game are simplistic, and while exploring the moon in Minmus, one eventually unlocks technology to make more elaborate stations, providing infrastructure for exploration of the other planets. Giant modular stations comparable to the Mir and the ISS will serve as refueling posts for missions to the game's Mars equivalent of Duna, or the Venus equivalent of Eve. While the real world has delayed this process a little due to funding issues, this is more or less what is happening now. What many people don't realize is that we are currently at the beginning of a second space race. After years of practice and perfecting technology and building infrastructure, we are finally ready to reach out properly into space again. This new space race has three goals as near as I can tell. Number one, return to the moon and stay there, mirrored in Kerbal Space Program with missions to start surface outposts on the moon and Minmus. Number two, take humans to Mars, which is always the first target outside the Kerbin system in the game as well or rather Duna is. Number three, make commercial spaceflight viable and available. It's happening, guys. Companies like Virgin Galactic are extremely close to being able to provide orbital and suborbital flights to the average person. The number of people who have been to space will skyrocket from 500 and something to thousands and then millions. KSP has no equivalent to this. Maybe the sequel game will, but this is the most exciting aspect of the second space race to me. We are going to space, everyone. And I mean everyone. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe to my channel, which is Dead Kennedy in Space. If you want to support me further, consider donating on Patreon or purchasing some of my work through Amazon or Teespring. Thank you, and I'll see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. Live there, on the mode of dust, suspended in a sunbeam, in a fast, Cosmic Arena.